So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, David Durismith and uh, Sarah Mega, whose uh, article has received an honorable mention uh, in this year's uh, Review of International Studies annual prize for the best article published in uh, Review of International Studies in uh, 2020. Uh, David uh, is a lecturer in uh, Gender and Politics in the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Sheffield. And his most recent book is Masculinity and New War, published by Routledge. Uh, and Sarah is a lecturer in international relations in the School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Melbourne. Her most recent book is uh, Rape, Loot, Pillage, the Political Economy of Sexual Violence in Armed Conflict, and it's published by Oxford University Press. Uh, David and Sarah's article, Returning to the Root, Radical Feminist Thought and Feminist Theories of International Relations, was published in Review of International Studies in 2020. It's in volume 46, number three, uh, and the link will be uh, in the notes for uh, this video. Um, the article looks at the silencing of radical feminism in uh, feminist international relations. Um, and David and Sarah trace the absence of radical feminism in much of feminist IR scholarship and its marginalization where it is engaged with. Um, they then look at the way that radical feminist ideas such as patriarchy haunt feminist IR and finally try to reclaim the promise of radical feminism uh, by looking at the way it can bring new insights to understandings of the state and feminist IPE. Um, and the judges, in giving an honourable mention to this uh, article, noted that uh, the authors excavate rich resources for theorising sex, the state and the international system by raising the ghosts of radical feminist thought, uh, underpinning feminist international relations, and they recalibrate foundational works moving IR beyond the received standards and the usual suspects. So welcome to David and Sarah. Um, I'll start with a question uh, for both of you, which is what led you to write about this particular topic? Well, we were both fortunate enough to have been supervised by the same iconic radical feminist, Professor Sheila Jeffries at the University of Melbourne. And I can't speak for David, but I know for myself, she was really instrumental um, during the supervision of my dissertation um, in getting me to push beyond the sort of catch-all thinking of feminist IR as one theoretical strand and to recognize the significance of radical feminist theory and action of the second wave for most of the policy inroads that feminism had made in the last several decades. Um, during that period, Sheila had invited Catherine McKinnon to give a public lecture at the University of Melbourne shortly after her book, Are Women Human? came out. And I remember how clearly her arguments um, about the complicity of the state in formulating laws that protect perpetrators and not victims of men's violence resonated for me. Um, but then I found as I was using um, this radical feminist thought in my work and then as an early career academic on the conference circuit um, presenting this work, I was being met with resistance from a number of other feminists uh, for adopting this sort of structural approach to thinking about, um, in my case, sexual and gender-based violence. One senior academic I remember at ISA was a discussant on my paper and had said, only had this to say about my work. Um, I don't like grand theorizing. I don't like it when theories fit too neatly. Um, which was frustrating because I felt like I was being met with resistance um, but I didn't feel like it was a good faith engagement and having discussions with David, he was experiencing sort of similar frustration at drawing on a body of scholarship that wasn't um, strongly represented or acknowledged within our field and really feeling like we had to continually make a case for its um, inclusion or its significance. Yeah, so do you I, I, I came from a similar perspective in that I came to feminism through radical feminist work, particularly writing from, from Kate Millett and Andrea Dawkin. And within that work, there was this real emphasis on a structural analysis on, of sexuality that was something that was quite different to a lot of the work in IR. And while we've seen this resurgence in interest in sexuality through queer theory, radical feminism offers quite a different approach to that. And I was really frustrated in that people had very formed views of what these early authors said, but often mm -hmm. it appeared to me that they actually hadn't necessarily read their work. And that this, the intention of the article was not to sort of give a catch-all defense of no one should criticize radical feminism, but just to say, 
read it. Um, you know, if you if there are things to disagree with and things that to to reject, that's absolutely uh, you know good and valuable. But but my sense was that often when people would say things like Andrea Dawkins thinks that all forms of heterosexual sexuality are rape, missed actually the key intention of what those claims were being made in the context that they were being made. So with the article, I really hope to um, that we both I think hope to to give. A, a more accurate or more generous account of that original radical feminist work. Yeah, okay. So that's really interesting. So in terms of the article, um, David, do you want to tell us what, what the key kind of argument and, and kind of key insight you'd want people to, to, to take away from the article is? There's a couple of points. But the, the, the overarching point I would say is that radical feminist theorizing on aspects such as patriarchy, the state, sexuality, economics was absolutely essential to the insights that brought feminism to international relations. But by the 1990s, when much of the early feminist IR work was being conducted, radical feminism was construed as being passe, too old, too extreme, and therefore not worthy engaging with. And in practice, what this manifested as was early texts would refer to radical feminist work, but not really engage. And I think for, for the overall article, we're arguing that we need to go back to those original arguments because they offer something different in a, a structural analysis of sex, gender, and power. Okay. I mean, what's, what, what I found interesting in the early part of the article is you, you say something like, you know, marginalization needs to be actively produced. Voices don't simply kind of recede to the periphery. They have to be actively placed there. I mean, Sarah, why do you think it is that radical feminists became marginalized uh, in, in, in feminist IR? Um, I think there's a few things that were going on at the time. I mean, this wasn't unique to feminist theory in international relations, but happening across political theory um, and social theory more generally, we saw um, radical feminism becoming less popular as um, post-structuralism in particular became uh, a much more prominent frame for thinking about gender relations. So partly I think there was a neophilia happening, which I think um, other scholars have talked about in international relations, that just the newest sort of ideas become um, the ones that we want to use to think through the problems we're tackling. Um, but another element I think personally is that academia has always been a rather exclusive field, particularly in terms of class. Um, I mean, obviously also sex and race, but I think this class division um, is partly behind the rising appeal of post-structuralism as an antidote to the proclaimed lack of nuance in structural theories, because I think privileged academics couldn't see themselves in the experiences described by radical feminists of the second wave, and certainly um, weren't the most active in the um, sort of activist element of the women's liberation movement where these ideas were being generated. And so this brings me to, I guess, the third sort of reason why I think it's become marginalized because radical feminism simultaneously was rejecting um, academic writing style, um, commenting political theory. They saw it as alienating and divorced from women's lived experiences. So much of radical feminist writing, um, we might call polemical because they are calls to action. They aren't, um, the sort of systematic um, and, and quite contained um, writing styles that had been adopted from the sort of legacy of political theorizing from the Enlightenment. So I think these elements combine to help create this story of radical feminism as being contained to a particular point in history and a particular um, course of action that was quite outside of the halls of the academy. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally, I find that, you know, that's a really fascinating section in the article to kind of think about how different voices are kind of actively, you know, kind of marginalized, actively put in the periphery. Um, and what, the, and, and in a way, uh, you know, that's framed in the article in terms of the marginalization of, of kind of radical feminism, but it also reflects a light on how the academy works, right? And I think uh, that's really fascinating. So David, if we kind of, if we, ret if we return to radical feminism, what, what do you think the kind of key sort of concepts or insights of radical feminism that you want to kind of recover for, for, for international relations would be? I mean, it's an absolute bounty of riches, but I would say one of the key things here is a structural reading of 
sex and gender. And in particular here, radical feminists really emphasize the role of intimate relationships as having structural power, of erotic relationships as reflecting relationships of dominance and subordination, and that these forms of power structured key aspects of the state, of the economy, and of our everyday politics. And you see this in Kate Millett's early articulation of the state um, being the institution by which half of the population, which is male, dominates half of the population, which is female. I think for radical feminism coming back to IR, I would say that there is an argument being put forward to go back to sex and sexuality, not simply as an, a site to explore identity and diverse experiences, of course, which has value and importance, but as a basis for analyzing violence, power and inequality, not only in its most visible and explicitly political form, but in the everyday forms of people's intimate relationships as foundational cornerstones of society and the international system. Yeah, I mean, I was struck by the way that kind of um, resonates with some of the, the work on intimate geopolitics that's been coming out as well and, and so on. And so I think that was really kind of, you know, kind of fascinating kind of set of insights. Um, I was also struck by the way in which you kind of characterized feminist IR as largely kind of accepting kind of the the, the mainstream, uh, you know, of IR, but adding gender into it. I mean, I suppose that kind of raises the question, Sarah, I mean, what does a kind of feminist IR that acknowledges the debt to radical uh, feminism kind of look like? I suppose there's two elements to answering this question. Firstly, to me, I think the most important um, way that this would look is a, a good faith sustained engagement with radical feminist theory. Um, both the returning to the early texts, like we attempt to do in this article, drawing on um, some of the, the first sort of published um, widely available works of radical feminists thinking through in these very early times, like there, there was nothing that they had to draw on. So it was quite nascent work. So re-engaging with that and developing and building from. Um, and it would also start with um, perhaps a return to some of the praxis that radical feminists had been arguing for um, in the second wave movement of the 60s and 70s, which is to, to theorize from a different perspective, to start from the lived experiences of the marginalized, of the subordinated, and develop theory, develop our concepts out of this, rather than starting with accepted knowledge and trying to reform it or reframe it through the lens of gender or through the lens of women. And so for me, I think this would really look like, um, you know, a return to the idea that our scholarship has not just um, theoretical import, but also can be a call to action, um, recognizing that there's um, a sort of core sex class analysis that we're not just trying to understand, but also undo with our work. Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, um, and, and kind of also returning, that kind of question of practice, praxis is really interesting, I think, and kind of also returning to something you said about sort of why radical feminism was marginalised, because it actually did that, it actually did that differently in kind of a different voice, if you like. I, mean, I suppose, David, um, not just kind of acknowledging that sort of conceptual debt and, and so on, but would it mean that we actually did our scholarship differently? Would we write about it differently? Would we research differently? I think absolutely. I mean, you saw the impact that radical feminism had on research in the way that it influenced work on standpoint epistemologies and the critique of science, for example, and how that then resonated with the early developments of feminist IR, you know, even with Cynthia Enloe's work. But, but I actually think that the radical feminist approach of not accepting the sort of abstracted authorial voice as being a politically valuable tool, but a tool that has potential for oppression and the value, frankly, of a bit of a polemic occasionally is something that I'm still strongly in favor of, you know, people who have been um, unlucky enough to have my teaching are well familiar with David's feminist rants. And I think that there's a real value there. I think there's also 
a real value to the model of consciousness raising in radical feminist work, which has become very passe and is not really as, as pleasant in the way that it focuses not just on individual choice and preference as a goal in itself, but exploring how power structures our own experiences. And I think that that does lead to some quite different forms of work that are more, um, you know, challenging to academic standards because the priority is frankly less with the scientific aspect of social science and more with the revolutionary goals of dismantling heterosexuality, patriarchy and male dominance in all corners that it's found. Mm, yeah. Um, well, thank you very much. I mean, I've just got one kind of last question, maybe David first and, and, and Sarah to finish. Uh, what are you working on now? Uh, how, is, how has this argument kind of been developed into your, into your future work? Um, at the moment, I'm working on two strands of work. One is writing a book on masculinity and um, peace building after conflict, particularly looking at the politics of groups who try to encourage men to challenge their own ingrained sexism and um, dismantle certain forms of masculine behavior. Uh, and the second strand of work is broadly around the, the idea of men and, and returning from combat about what vulnerability means. And this is sort of comparative work looking at foreign fighters in contrast with state military personnel and trying to extend arguments that were put forward um, around the everyday experience of militarism by figures like Kathleen Barry. Nice. Um, for me, I've been working on surviving a pandemic. <laughs> uh, it's put things on hold, but hopefully I'll be able to return to um, some nascent research projects that have been interested in the, I guess, the gendered drivers of armed conflict generally. So I've been trying to understand this through an examination of um, the motivations for participating in the Ukrainian armed conflict, the, the war in Eastern Ukraine, um, and conduct this sort of structural level uh, feminist and also political economy analysis of the, the sort of structural determinants of why people fight. Brilliant. Well, we look forward to reading those. Thank you very much for talking to me today. It's a fascinating article and, uh, and the commendations of the judges uh, are, are richly deserved. Um, and I would strongly recommend that everybody uh, downloads it, reads it uh, and takes its kind of insights on board. So thank you for talking to me. Thank you, Martin. Thank you so much.